want to upfront acknowledge that although some of us um, were involved in the discussions during the legislative session, this stakeholder process today, um, we're looking at as a new start, uh, a reset. It's uh, hopefully an opportunity to turn down some of the heat and shed light on the issue of how um, to extend minimum wage coverage to agricultural workers. And um, we are definitely not interested in pitting one group of people against another. Um, we're gonna spend some time today doing what we think of as level setting. Um, we'll begin by getting grounded in some basic data around agriculture here in Maine. And then we'll do some baseline definitions about agricultural workers. And I see my job today and through this process is trying to help lead a respectful process along with my co-chair, Deputy Commissioner McBrady, and assisting us in the task um, will be Jody uh, Sapphire. Jody is a special assistant to Commissioner Beal, and she's provided process facilitation for numerous groups tackling complex discussions. And even though I said it was gonna be a, a reset, I did not say that I thought that this was, you know, um, not going to be complicated. And as you know, the governor has appointed all of us uh, and we have that shared responsibility of achieving the executive order outcome of a shared understanding of expanding minimum wage to agricultural workers. And I look forward to our work together. I will turn it over to, all right. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, like Commissioner Fortnum mentioned, I'm Nancy McBrady. I'm with the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. Appreciate everyone being here for this reset as she so aptly uh, framed it. And I wanna thank our agricultural attendees here in person today and maybe joining uh, virtually on what is a hot and likely very productive day. Um, summer finally showing up in September. Um, as the executive order made clear, which you've all seen, um, our, our task is an important one, one taken seriously by our governor, and one that has defined a, a fairly narrow path forward with respect to understanding um, impacts should agriculture minimum wage move forward, and so that we can all get to the end of this process, perhaps still having different opinions about things, but knowing what is and is not a part of that going forward. Um, we were, most of us, uh, involved in May and June discussions, and I do think that this slightly slower time frame um, will give us more time to dig in and gain clarity, which I think is really important. Um, and again, uh, as a committee, we'll, we'll have a baseline understanding of outcomes going forward. Um, I'm looking forward to a respectful and, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, sound to <clears throat> opportunity for us all to work together in the coming weeks and an organized process with the help of our facilitator, uh, Jody. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I know a few of you, but most of you I don't know. I, as Commissioner Fortman said, I'm Jody Sapphire, and I do work in the Commissioner's Office of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. And I'm really looking forward to working with all of you. Um, my goal here right now is simply to introduce the idea of introductions and um, give you a little bit of a preview of what we're going to do for um, the next few minutes before we review the agenda. So um, basically, um, we'd like everyone to get to know one another a little better personally. And um, we're going to ask that each of you, in a particular order, say who you are, the organization that you um, represent, and then if you have had an experience where you have worked for minimum wage, um, tell us what that was and what the circumstances were. And we'll do this in a particular order. We'll ask the co-chairs to do that first. And then um, President Jackson, um, representative of uh, the speaker, Tom Harnett, and then we'll um, I'll jump in and do the same, and then we'll go around the room to make sure we hear from everyone, and then we'll move on from there. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Laura Fortman, Commissioner in the Maine Department of Labor, and yes, I have worked for minimum wage jobs. I, I started my career working in retail and uh, spent a lot of time earning minimum wage, um, both while I was in high school and then as a young parent. 
Nancy McBrady, Deputy Commissioner, Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My most uh, memorable minimum wage job was when I was a dishwasher in a restaurant in Dock Square, Kennebunkport, that was Italian and did not have lobster on the menu. And it was not a very long employment because the restaurant did not go very far in that environment. But <laughs> Thank you. Senator Jackson. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Troy Jackson. I'm the Senate President. I represent Senator District 1. Northern Maine, in case any of you aren't sure, I live in Allegash. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess the first, I, I'm not sure if I actually worked for minimum wage. I worked on a tree farm. And I think I was in the eighth grade or freshman year, and my older cousin uh, was asked, uh, well, he asked the, the foreman, you know, what are we getting? He said, well, we're getting minimum wage. I said, well, what's that? The foreman asked, he said, I don't know, what, what, what is it right now? And my cousin, who was older and obviously more smart, uh, said it was 375. And at that point, it was actually 315. So <laughs> I, I guess I didn't work for it, but uh, the, the foreman thought I did. <laughs> well played, well played. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Harnett. I am here representing uh, Speaker Rachel Talbot Ross today. Um, I'm an ex-legislator. I've worked with uh, farm workers and within four farm workers for about 43 years. And all of my jobs in high school and college were minimum wage. That was in the 1970s. I don't think it was a lot of money, but it seemed like a lot of money at the time. Um, well, as I said, Jody Sapphire with the Commissioner's Office at the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry. And um, I think perhaps the most relevant minimum wage job that I've held was uh, a year after I graduated early from high school, I, in suburban Connecticut, I ended up outside of Indianapolis detasseling seed corn um, for a summer. Um, and for those who are familiar with hybrid seed corn operations, um, one mile long rows of corn and um, you have to detassel six rows in order to have the two rows that you maintain breed pollinate the six rows that you detasseled and um, that was for an entire summer and it was blazing hot like today and it's why i ended up in maine in a northern climate <laughs> <laughs> so um so why don't we start at this corner um i am Jeannie tapley i am the assistant executive director for the maine potato board and my um very first job was picking potatoes for the maine potato industry uh, for a grower that was right next door and that was 50 cents per barrel so that was well under minimum wage uh, my name is arthur phillips with the maine center for economic policy and worked a, a bunch of minimum or near minimum wage jobs um, high school and college shortly thereafter but my first job after finishing college was at an irish pub that was named after a famous irish american boxer however it was spelled wrong <laughs> so everyone came in let plenty of people came in with them be like I, I think it's misspelled and we just kind of have to bow our head to uh, i was actually paid nothing uh except for tips uh so that that place was breaking the law uh and i wasn't in a, in a in a place where i felt comfortable uh, taking that step, unfortunately, but um, that's that's one example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, hi, so my name is Sean Douglas. I'm operations director at Mono Mono. I'm here um, representing Juana Rodriguez Vasquez, who is our executive director. Um, and I, in high school and college, worked a variety of kind of like food service related jobs. I also worked in as a dishwasher in an Italian restaurant. Um, I worked in different coffee shops and I was a server at a restaurant as well, which obviously with tips and make above minimum wage, I was not a very good server, uh, <laughs> not really my strength. So, uh, I would say I was on the lower end of the compensation, but, um, yeah, so. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Heath Miller. I'm representing Maine Dairy Industry Association. Um, I'm also a dairy farmer. Um, my family and I milk 250 cows. Um, so I would say as far as the minimum wage go, um, if I were to take the amount of hours that I work and times it times minimum wage, that would be far more than I actually take home. So uh, I guess that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> 
Um, good afternoon. My name is Heather Spaulding, and I am representing Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, MAFCA. Um, and I also had a bunch of minimum wage jobs in high school and college. Um, <clears throat> my first job out of college was uh, an internship in D.C., which paid I can't even remember what it was, like $250 every couple of weeks or something like that. So not a lot of money to be living in D.C., but I did supplement that working at a bar um, so I could pay the bills. And that was a long, long day, eight-hour day, and then working from 6 to, like, 1 in the morning. Um, so definitely know how important um, minimum wage is. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ann Macri. I am an assistant attorney general. Um, I am not a member of the committee, but I am here to provide technical assistance and support. I have to give you my caveat, which is that my presence here does not represent any position on behalf of the office of the attorney general. Um, my very first job was a minimum wage job at Porches at the Auburn. Mall. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Eric Venturini. I'm the executive director of the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine. Um, one of my first minimum wage jobs was uh, actually at the University of Maine. Uh, as a freshman, I started working at the Lean Bound Adventure Center, where I basically uh, helped kids climb the rock wall mm -hmm. as the certified belayer. I did that uh, for about four years, and I think every year we got about a quarter more on top of uh, the minimum wage that started as a freshman. <laughs> Um, hi, my name is Mike Ware. I'm from representing Pine Tree Legal Assistance. I work in our farm worker unit. I've been representing farm workers in Maine for more than 20 years now. Um, and my first job ever was um, as a caddy at the Portland Country Club many, many years ago. And um, we used to, it took about four hours to play a round of golf. Um, and there were two caddies, two or four of them. We each carried two bags and we got $4. Uh, so it was very sub minimum wage. There you go. Wow. Thank you. Um, Holly. Holly, thank I'm you. Holly Francis, uh, product manager for Passable Body Wild Blueberry Company, um, here in place of Darren for today. Um, plenty of minimum wage jobs in high school and college, but my first job out of college brought me to Maine, and I was driving trucks cross country and setting up events in the middle of fields. So it was a very fun job. Lots of uh, truck stop experience on that one, but yeah. Thank you. Shelly. Hi, everyone. I'm Shelly McGuire. I work for Maine Farmland Trust. Um, like others, plenty of below minimum wage or minimum wage jobs early on. Um, the most no noteworthy may be working at a horse breeding farm in Bangor for harness, harness racers, um, the uh, Darlings, I believe it was, their farm. So. Got very muscular by the end of this. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Matt. Hey everyone, I'm Matt Schlobohm. I'm the executive director of the Maine AFL CIO for a statewide federation of 200 labor unions. Um, and my first I think my freshman year in high school, I worked at Nemo's restaurant as a busboy and dishwasher. Um, and that was a minimum wage job. And the thing I remember most about it was my hands would get really, really Neely from being in the water, and then the industrial dishwasher was insanely hot, just pulling up and scalded with your hands and try to figure out ways to make our time after we open. Thank you all. Um, so a couple notes, apologies, Heather, for misspelling your name, both on the card, but also in the list, we'll correct that. Um, Tom, if you are able to email Emily Horton to let her know the room number and that it starts at one, um, and um, we're going to be recording these meetings. I didn't think it was necessary to record um, the introductions, but we will be recording these meetings so that the public has access to them from the website. And so all comments are on the record, all meetings are public. Um, and did you have a question? Yeah, I just, uh, I, Senator Mike Tipping is in the back chair of the Labor Committee. I asked Mike to be here because. You might have to sit in, or we might switch back and forth at okay. times. So, good. Thank you. Thank you. And and a number of people on this committee have some alternates. And one thing that um, I 
like to impress upon everyone is, you know, we were quite intentional about having this first meeting be in person so that you all get to know one another a little bit better. And so for those who are swapping in alternates um, for future meetings or in and out, it would be very helpful if you could share both the working agreements that we'll be reviewing in a few minutes and encourage those individuals to be looking to the uh, extent they're able to be looking at the video of the previous meeting. So they're somewhat informed coming into the meeting. It will make your work a lot more efficient and uh, with everyone having sort of a common understanding of what we're doing. Um, I think those were the three items. Um, so we're going to turn to Ann um, to walk through the remote participation policy and um, see if you then have any questions about that for clarification. Okay, so I, I believe there should be a copy of this in your packets. Um, this is a policy that um, is required um, to be in compliance with our OA obligations, public uh, meeting obligations. Um, and I'm not going to go over this in great detail. It, it, largely, it mirrors what our obligations are under FOA, but it um, specifically includes um, a mechanism if folks have accommodation requests, um, allows for uh, public comment, um, and when there are meetings that are entirely virtual, um, there will the notice will include a location where members of the public can attend that meeting, even though it's technically a virtual meeting. Um, I think that's sort of a high point. Um, if anyone has any particular questions. Any points of clarification? All right. Well, um, so I'll do a quick agenda review so that we all can get grounded on what we're trying to accomplish today. Um, do we, I think we oh, need please. to vote on that, Julie. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> technically, we need to adopt. <laughs> yeah, 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 sorry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, so is there a process or we just say it? it just the co-chairs need to agree to adopt the policy, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Not seeing any questions, questions or objections. Or I think I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <Nancy. Okay. laughs> we just want to make sure we're in compliance yes. with whatever, whatever the rules are. First rule of business, <laughs> successful. Okay. Good. Um, so um, we have laid out um, the work of the day and um, we have a commitment to get getting you uh, meeting materials as much in advance as we're able to. You'll notice when in the in a few minutes when we go through the dates of the meetings, there's some inconsistency about the um, pacing between the meetings for particular reasons. We will do our best to get you materials after next meeting as soon as possible, given that the third meeting is so close to the second. But um, so you will have had an opportunity under most circumstances to spend some time with the meeting packet. So we're going to assume that you'll have shown up having read the materials and probably have some test questions teed up already or things that you wanna you know, see if we can, we can cover. So um, with that, I won't read through this agenda with you because I'll assume that you will have read it, but um, we will be um, uh, reviewing the working agreements. We will be having um, some presentations on kind of an, a high level overview of Maine agriculture and um, a review of some basic definitions of the types of agricultural workers working in the state right now. And some of this may feel dry, but it's essential for gaining kind of this baseline understanding upon which every other piece of information will build in, in future meetings. So you know, bear with us and, and we wanna make sure that you all understand those and that you have your questions answered about those definitions. Um, We'll be providing an opportunity for public input toward the end of every meeting and toward the end was intentional because our hope is that for members of the public um, listening in, whether remotely or in person, that you haven't so much come with like a presentation or a statement that you wanna make. It's really in response to what you've learned as well during the meeting itself. So if there are clarifying questions or points you wanna make sure that the committee covers at a future meeting, that's what's gonna be most helpful, I would say, to the committee itself. Um, and yeah, and we'll review the timeline. So 
with that, any questions about the agenda as a whole before we move on to these draft working agreements? Yeah. Thank you. As we get closer to the end, will the public input time increase? Do you, do you imagine? Well, one th I it was we winged it this time. We weren't sure how many members of the public will express an interest and how many will want to speak. I want to. We want to make sure that we give you all the majority of the time to work through what you're working through. We see your roles as meeting with your constituents in between meeting, sharing information and you being the primary conduit through which the rest of the committee members learn what is of concern or unclear to your constituents. So that's one of the reasons why you all have been appointed to the committee, that you are the conduits and the communicators to some extent because you have access to a large portion of constituents. That said, if we learn at a particular meeting that there are 40 people that wanna speak, um, we're going to need to figure it out on the fly and get probably get your input on that as well. Um, one thought would be to limit the amount of time that each person speaks, and then for the if there's not enough time, encourage people to write down their comments, submit them, and we'll make absolutely sure that the rest of you know the committee gets them. So, you know, it'll be a little iterative, and we'll kind of see what the level of, of interest and concern is about that. Yeah, and, and Tom, there is a, a web page that that is available to folks. So if they had comments or they want to get on an interested party list, there's an opportunity for folks to do that. And as Jody said, part of this is iterative. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Also, I'm hoping that once we go through the actual executive order, um, the, there are some pretty clear guardrails about what we're expected to be doing. And our goal is to stay within those guardrails. Thank you. Any other questions or about the agenda? Okay. All right, then um, turning to the um, draft work agreement, working agreements, and you all have, uh, I should have mentioned, you all have a packet in front of you. I should have also mentioned where the restrooms are to the extent that um, you're unfamiliar with this building. Right out the door, it's immediately to the left. We will be having our next meeting in this same space. So, um, so you'll be familiar with how to get in and, in and out of here next time. So the working agreements, um, I generally introduce some set of working agreements um, at the beginning of any major stakeholder process. And what I find is that um, to sort of know what the expectations are of oneself and of one another makes for a smoother process, makes for more work actually getting done. So um, the, the larger paragraph at the top of this is simply to sort of restate what is um, implied or, or explicit in, in, in different ways in the executive order itself, that this is a committee that's advisory in nature. And that... Um, one of the primary goals of the executive order is to um, try to achieve a common understanding of the subject matter. Um, and um, so we will be spending time at each of the meetings providing educational information and making sure that the, that information is well understood. And um, we really wordsmithed this one line, the committee's work will be guided by an aspiration to achieve consensus, which is different than saying, um, we'll be working to, you know, we, we will only be, uh, that it will only be <laughs> uh, achieving consensus. Um, uh, it's really to sort of set an intention and hope that we can arrive at something and that we all work with that spirit in mind. Um, as I mentioned before, all meetings are public, comments on the record, meetings are being recorded, and will be posted to the website. And so um, in line with the way that we started this meeting, we'll be starting on time. We will absolutely be ending on time. We realize the commitment that you're making um, to this process. And if um, all of the hours are used and all of the dates are used, it's, an, it's a very large uh, number of hours. So um, we want to respect your time in that way. And um, all remote meetings will be shorter. And um, we'll try, if we can shorten these meetings more, we'll, we'll try to do that. Um, 
we're hoping that when the meetings are in person and roughly every other meeting, um, but for the first two, um, are being alternated. Every other meeting is, is in person and every other meeting is online. Our hope is that for those in-person meetings that you or an alternate is able to show up. And again, it's based on the belief that when people are in a room together, they tend to do better work together than um, and more effective work together than if they're working remotely. Um, with that in mind, when you are working remotely, we ask, unless there are significant bandwidth problems uh, with your internet that you be uh, visible. And so we know we have your full attention, you have the attention of one another. And, um, and so that's why that's in there. Um, I already mentioned about trying to get you meeting materials as well in advance as possible. And we hope that you will come having read that material and having um, you know, teed up concerns or questions that you have so that we can be efficient with our time together. Being present and engaged is often um, just sort of assumed, um, but what I find is that um, if phones are on, at my best, I'm giving you about 92% of my attention at, any, at the, best, the best that I show up. And 4% is with my family and 4% is over health issues and 1% is just baseline scatteredness. And so in the best possible way, um, you're only getting that. And with any more distraction, um, for any of us, you get a lot less of that of one another. So um, that, again, is, is why our hope is that you will focus here. Um, some people process externally and talk a lot and others not so much. And so we just ask that you be aware of one another and see if everyone can participate and has room to do that. Um, and we hope that you'll leave having learned something at the end of every meeting, not just having expressed your opinion, but actually taking in new information and possibly having a broadened or different perspective than you came in with. Um, and then this is a, a dicey issue. There are strong opinions um, and we hope that when you're expressing them, you express them in a thoughtful and kind manner. And then finally, and this will seem like somebody just putting a smiley face at the end of a, of, of a you know, or being Pollyanna, but I truly believe that humor helps um, achieve processes. There are stand-up comedians whose entire shtick is about cancer. And so I believe that every conversation can be aided with, with humor. And I hope that we are able to have that in this process as well. Questions, concerns about any of that, things that you are, or if you feel like something's missing. All right, then I'm going to assume that that is adoption of those as well. Yes, yes, okay, all right. Um, we're gonna move on to a review of the executive order. We're on. Okay. You all have a copy of the executive order uh, in your packet. We thought that we would take some time to go through its various components. I will be starting with the preamble. Again, because so many of you were active in the conversations of, of May and June, um, I don't, uh, you know, some of this might be um, quite apparent to you. But, um, you know, the preamble is obviously setting the stage for the decision making um, put forward by the governor. Um, and she was recognizing the scope and size and impact and importance of agriculture to Maine's economy um, in this first preamble section, uh, recognizing how many people devote their, their lives to it and how it does support our economy across many millions of acres of farmland. Um, and that our agricultural workers, uh, the farmers and the farm workers, and they are often the same uh, as well, being the, the, the ones who grow and produce our, our vibrant food system. Um, we do recognize that all who make their living in agriculture deserve fair wages for their labor and for their work. And we all know that LD 398 had proposed to um, and had been passed by the 131st legislature. Um, however, there were concerns shared by the governor with respect to its potential scope and terminology in it and potential unintended consequences, which led her to veto that bill. 
Um, however, there is a baseline expectation that the governor feels is that any legislation moving forward relative to minimum wage for agricultural workers should be enacted whereby everyone involved has a clear understanding of those resulting impacts, whatever they may be, on the state and federal labor employment and, and those other relevant laws. Um, so that is a, a broad category, which we will be going through very finely um, with this advisory board, but that's setting the stage with the preamble and I'll turn it over to you, Commissioner. Thank you. And so moving on here, the other piece of this is that there's a, a, a commitment to having a minimum wage for agricultural workers and that all of the um, potential um, uh, implications are clearly understood by everyone uh, and that this is our chance to raise um, those, um, answer those questions here so that there is absolutely no misunderstanding about what this means, but that the focus is on a minimum wage for agricultural workers. And in order to achieve that understanding, um, the governor has asked us to identify relevant state and federal labor laws and um, that may apply to seasonal and full-time farm workers um, and to explore some of the issues that were raised at the end of the session around minimum, uh, around unemployment, record keeping, piecework, overtime uh, limitations, wage calculation, uh, housing and other issues. And to be really clear about where those laws fit and what, if any, intersection there is with a minimum wage law. Um, so to remove any confusion about that uh, and to review terminology, because I think there were also some questions about who we're we talking about in different circumstances. So clarifying that is critical um, and identifying um, any other issues uh, that can be easily analyzed on as necessary. Um, and to also, and this is the part I really love, identify any gu guidance from the Department of Labor that we can provide to help assist employers um, regarding this proposed, um, that was an attempt at that humor there, um, <laughs> because we don't have enough, we don't have enough to keep us busy. No, but I think overall, I mean, it, our goal here is there were a lot of issues that were raised during the legislative session. There was not a common understanding of how uh, or if there was an interplay between any of those things. And we wanna make sure that this committee really has an opportunity to dig into those issues uh, and see how things uh, line up. Uh, the membership of the committee is really clear. We're all sitting around the table here. Um, and I don't think there's any confusion about that. Um, and then in terms of proceedings, I think much of this was laid out by Jody already. Um, the two departments are going to co-chair this um, and that uh, we have the authority to break into subgroups if necessary or subcommittees. Uh, and um, and we'll meet as necessary to complete the tasks. Uh, the, there is a deadline here of submitting um, our findings to the governor by December 1st, which is why you'll see a, an aggressive meeting schedule that I think everyone has received ahead of time. And as Jody pointed out, we may or may not meet all of the time we've allocated for this, um, but we do have some flexibility about number of meetings. And uh, since we've just passed our agreement to hold some meetings virtually, I think we're in, in alignment with, we can conduct these either in person or virtually. Any questions or <clears throat> Nancy, did I forget no, something? I think you did a good job. I mean, we, we, we've all had some time to look at this. I think we've, we've tried to um, explain our attempts to organize this in, a, in an orderly process. Um, if you have suggestions, questions, concerns, certainly um, we're happy to hear them, but that is our clear read of the commitment that uh, the governor is asking us to make over the next uh, several weeks. Thank you so much for all the organizing. I really appreciate it and the framing. Um, I appreciated your comment about this being a reset. 
Um, and, you know, I think it seems like the, there's a broad realm of possible outcomes or scope of possible outcomes. But um, one thing I just wanted to um, inquire about was a, co a concept that came up at the Agricultural Council of Maine meeting that we had um, on Tuesday, where um, somebody said that the purpose of this uh, stakeholder group or this, this, this gathering was to figure out some way to do, come up with a minimum wage without classifying farm workers as employees. And I didn't read that. That's not the way I read the executive order. And I just wanted to see if that was part of the governor's intent or uh, if maybe I'm not seeing it here or if in fact that is um, not really a parameter that we all have to accept at the beginning. Of this. So I think that's a really interesting question, Heather, and I'm hoping that as we start going through the presentations, we can, I, I think that's one of the things that got tossed out there that was, uh, took us down a rabbit hole we didn't need to go in um, about, oh, are we classifying people as employees or are we not classifying people as employees? That that's That's not the conversation that I think we're tasked with having. We're tasked with looking at providing a minimum wage to agricultural workers. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit and I'm looking over, even though she's not representing the attorney general's office, um, an attorney who helps us. And I think uh, maybe we can circle back to this after Anne's presentation today, because we are going to look at workers and coming up with some common definitions. And then I think our plan for the next meeting is to dig into that a little bit deeper. So I think another way of putting it is we can answer that question by doing the work yeah. of understanding existing definitions as they exist in state and federal law and seeing whether or not that question is already answered versus not. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think the baseline is what, what is the current lay of the legal world when it comes to employment in agriculture in Maine um, and whether those questions still persist after we have a clear walkthrough of how they apply. Thank you. That was much clearer than what I was saying. So I'm assuming, Heather, you're going to hold that question in your mind and you, you'll you see whether two meetings from now or three meetings from now, it still feels like the same question to you. So stick with it if you if you feel like you need to. But I do think to the co-chair's point, some of this will become evident as we go through these presentations. Other questions before we move on? All right, so um, the next item is just um, looking briefly at the meeting schedule. As I mentioned, um, we had hoped to be very consistent and have a meeting every other week, um, but because of various conflicts, um, we weren't able to do that for the first two meetings. We also had originally thought we would do an in-person and then a virtual and then an in-person and then a virtual, but the next meeting will be pretty meaty in terms of presentation content. And um, Commissioner Fortman can explain that better than I, but um, we thought that it would be just more productive to have you all here in person to do that. And so we opted to do the first two meetings in person and then the two after that virtually to give you all frankly a break um, for travel and whatnot. Um, so, we don't have the expectation that everybody will be able to be at every meeting. I just don't think it's realistic with a group of 15 people. That's why we were hoping that, you know, you could designate an alternate or uh, review the tapes uh, right afterwards so that you come, you know, feeling like you're, you haven't missed critical information the next time you come. But if there are, if for some reason any one of you is aware that there is a date here that many of you would not be able to make. We definitely want to know that. I'm not quite sure how you'd figure that out, but if you want to make us aware of major conflicts where you think you can't, nor can your alternate show up, we'll, we'll certainly take that under advisement and see if that can be accommodated. It will be tricky um, because it was hard to come up with these dates. I'll be completely candid about that. But um, 
This is 16 and a half hours if you end up spending all 17, seven of your meetings. And if you're able to feel like, you know, you accomplished uh, your objectives prior to meeting seven, then, then great. And we just won't hold the, the last uh, couple of meetings. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Any questions about this? Go ahead. Um, just, just a question. We went over the remote participation policy. So I know, for instance, the 25th, I can attend remotely. I cannot attend physically because I'm just not going to be in the state. That is still an option. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. Thank you. We're trying to discourage it wherever uh, it's possible. Understood. And if it's not, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that challenge, like, I'm not sure, Jody, if anyone is trying to participate, like if Julianne is trying to participate remotely, and whether or not we're we have a mechanism for making sure so that if Tom is participating remotely, we get, him, get his voice in the room. Yes, um, and uh, we will certainly make a note of that particular meeting where um, Tom Gordon behind you, who works with the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry, who's staffing the Zoom account right now and set that up, um, he's keeping track when you are meeting remotely, he will be keeping track of who is a committee member so that you're on screen and who is not so that we're not seeing a gajillion people. And um, mm -hmm. we'll make sure that you are on screen, Tom, for instance, uh, when, when you can't. So in that way, we're trying okay. to accommodate committee members. Um, and I'm not sure what to say about Julianne if-, if I did send her uh, information, but I hadn't, I'd heard uh, you know, that she would be here. Okay. I'm not sure if something came up, yeah. but she does have the information and the passcode yeah. uh, to, to access. Okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure she wasn't sitting Precisely. somewhere and yeah. not having a chance to weigh in. Yeah. Tom, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, other Tom, uh, Julianne Smith. Uh, she, she did log on earlier. I see, I see there's a Julie listed as a guest. I, I'm not sure if that's... Okay. Do you want to, uh, do you want to switch her audio on so that we can see whether that is her. And that's for she. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, good call. I'm sorry about that. Um, so Julianne, if, if you are accessing remotely and could let us know so that we're um, having you participate as a committee member, that would be great. We'll keep your audio on for, for a while. Um, okay, other questions? Heather. I just wanted to follow, um, I may be, it may be too tricky for me to be here physically um, for the next one. It's the Monday right after Common Ground Fair mm -hmm. and we have a lot of cleanup to do that day, but I will try to be here and if I can, I'll be Zooming in next time. Great, thank you for letting us know. Okay, anything else before we move on? Okay. So, um, so we're going to turn to two different presentations, um, Deputy Commissioner McBrady first, then um, Ann Macri second, and um, Tom is going to, Tom Gordon is going to queue up the slide presentations and these should be visible to um, remote public members as well. I just want to make sure that because we're being so speedy in our Time, do some time here. We will take a break later. When oh, gosh. For that. I, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Do we want to take a break before that? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just, I thought we keep going. I just um, zoomed right by that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that good? Okay. Wonderful. Sorry about that. No, no, that's okay. Um, all right. Well, in terms of um, your time on topics, I have done that. Um, my, my technical presentation is um, giving a very brief and high level overview of agriculture in Maine with the intention of just providing us a little bit of baseline information about the size and scope and wonderful depth of agriculture. Um, certainly it's impossible to capture the nuances and vibrancy of, of Maine agriculture um, in just one presentation and certainly many people around this table could do a far better job than I could. Um, and, and yet, uh, as we talk about agriculture, it does seem like a good thing to, to take a few moments to provide some grounding in some statistics and uh, information, um, in particular about some of the crops and, and, and commodities uh, that are participating in this 
um, exercise as well. I will state that um, many of the statistics are grounded in the 2017 uh, USDA um, Ag Census, which seems like 100 years ago at this point. And while the 2022 information was collected for that, that census, the, um, the Statistics Center for USDA will not be releasing the 2022 Ag Census until next year, probably spring or summer. So I've tried to augment where I can um, with more up-to-date information. Um, and again, just this is this is a, a baseline, broadly speaking. It, it takes a little bit more from what was sent in your packet which is from um, the National Agricultural Statistics Service and adds a little bit more of a, of a main uh, uh, twist to it. So without further ado, when Tom's able to um, advance to the next slide, that would be Sorry. great. That's okay, no problem. Um, and I'm realizing this is far away, so I'll be squinting <laughs> too. Um, so as of 2017, we had uh, 7,600 farms, um, noted in this in the census. Uh, the vast majority of them are diversified um, uh, and 537 according to MAFCA's impact report from 2022 are organic farms of various varying sizes and different types. 1.3 million acres are utilized um, in a number of different ways that are further explained um, as cropland, pastureland, woodland, and other. Um, the average size farm is 172 acres. Uh, we do outpace uh, crop sales, um, sorry, we outpace livestock and poultry and other types of production with crops in the state of Maine. Um, and we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail about that, but there are farms in every county. Um, the, the geography, the climate, it, it makes for varying different uh, differences in some places of the state. But again, the vast majority, as we'll see with our smaller farms in particular, grow a little bit or raise a little bit of everything. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, family farms make up the majority of our, our um, sector here. This is a designation on their federal tax form. Um, they are not, you know, uh, partnerships or corporations. These are basically sole proprietorships or families. Um, they are a, a sizable chunk, um, sell direct to consumers. So I hope you know and love your local farmers markets. Um, they are very vibrant in this state. The number of farms that hire farm labor uh, are about 29%. That might seem low, but when we talk about some of the categories of size farms, it will become more apparent as to why that number is actually high, in my opinion. Um, $134 million uh, back in 2017, were, uh, or 25% of farm costs went towards labor. And as we all know, some major things happened uh, in the relative recent past that have drastically uh, increased farm inputs. The pandemic, uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, as well as the inflation that we still continue to deal with, um, no doubt might, might change some of these uh, statistics when they come out next year. Next slide, please, Tom. I'm sorry you can't see this, guys. Uh, we, can, we will be posting this. What is interesting is down at the bottom where the uh, rows are very big and and, and I have more data on this that hopefully is readable in the next slide. The vast majority of our farms are small. That number, Tom, can you read that base row for me, please? It's over 2,000 or 1,000? It's is less than $1,000 in sale, and there are 19, 1,934 farms in that category. Okay, and so the next four are, where do they, those larger bars go up to? Mm -hmm. Fifth one up is 10,000 to 24,999. Okay, and that's how many farms are listed there? Well, there, it is, that row, it's 997. Okay, thanks. Um, and then in the very top, those that with sales over 5 million, there's 15, as I recall? Yes. Okay. Um, we'll have an inverse of this slide in a moment, um, breaking, breaking down these, these stats a different way. Um, let's go to the more readable next slide, hopefully. Thanks. And again, we'll, we'll get these copies to you later. Um, 
these first stats of farms by value of sales and farms by size are in the state profile um, that was provided to you. But it, it is pretty striking that 41% of our farms, uh, 3,000 um, or so, earn less than or sell less than $2,500 um, in, in uh, products. Um, and we get to around 700 farms that are having sales of, of $100,000 or more at the other end of the spectrum, where it's a smaller portion, 9% of our total farms. Um, and interestingly, the, the, the just size of these farms as well and their acreage uh, is in the next column on the side there. So in, in some, there's a very large percentage of, of our farms in the state that are, are quite small. Um, and on average, farms had about $2,600 of sales per acre in 2017. And I think the real takeaway here is that average net income per farm back in 2017 was less than 17,000. And likewise, the net income for producers was also under 17,000. Next slide, please. Likewise, very hard to read, I apologize. Um, this is the inverse of two slides ago, but basically it's essentially saying that um, the total value of sales uh, for farms, and there are 15 farms with over $5 million in sales, and, though, and these farms account for almost $190 million in sales. So 10% of our farms produce 90% of the market value. So again, I'm not, this is not a judgment call, but Maine is this, this diversity of, of, of mostly small farms, with diversified products, um, and then the, the value, uh, market value, market cap, if you will, really starts um, uh, shrinking relative to, to, to larger farms. Next slide, please. This is a, a Overview for, by Farm Credit East. Some of you might know them uh, as these are, these are lenders here in the uh, private lenders in this Northeast. They put out an economic engine report every few years for all of New England. This is a snapshot of Maine. Um, it's kind of interesting. We do have all sorts of types of farming in the state, um, everything. And sometimes people forget, but nurseries and horticulture, they're part of our production practices here too. Um, so we have some really interesting statistics about dairy cattle, poultry, grain, oilseed, uh, et cetera. Um, and then I think after, as you can see down at the very bottom, direct sales, we're looking at 2 billion, uh, third, 3 billion for economic impact, 3.6 billion, and employment is estimated at 27,000 overall um, jobs. And I do believe that's sort of the multiplier effect. It's trucking, it's cold storage, it's, in addition to, to folks on the farms themselves. Next page, please. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about some of uh, the, the folks here at the table and elsewhere um, with wild blueberries. You might know I do have a soft spot for wild blueberries. Um, we grow 10% of all blueberries in, in America with nearly 100% of all wild blueberries. We are very blessed to have the geographic and um, uniqueness of, of wild blueberries being um, original uh, to, to this state. Um, 485 farms uh, grow and produce wild blueberries over 39,000 acres, primarily down east, um, but they, they are uh, also found throughout Maine. Um, Five-year average, including 2022, was 71 million pounds of wild blueberries, the vast majority of which is frozen. Um, Wild blueberries uh, producers do utilize both H2A and um, non-H2A labor. Um, because of the size and scope of the, these fields um, and because of labor shortages, there has been a trend over the last decade or more to try and automate harvesting. Um, and it's certainly not the, the name of the game for all producers, but automation um, certainly has uh, become more um, utilized uh, within the last decade. Next paragraph, and, and Eric and Holly, please come up to me afterwards and correct me on anything that I, or shout it out now, I've got <laughs> any of that wrong. Yes, is this being streamed or do you have to be let in? Uh, it's on, we have a Zoom. Yep. It, there, we Somebody have trying a, to get in? Yeah. Trying to get in. Okay. We, there's a web page and a link. Senator, I'll send you an email with the information you need. Um, 
Maine, uh, it's no surprise to anyone, is home to, to potatoes. And we're actually in the top 10 for potato production. I believe we were number six, I think five for 2022. Great. Um, the main farm, the main potato board uh, has an economic impact uh, study that has um, some really interesting statistics with respect to $540 million in sales. Uh, and over $230 million in personal income and 32 million in state and local taxes. The graph up at the top, it, it's unfortunate, you can't quite see it. 2020 was the year of the drought. You all can remember that right in the middle of COVID too. Really tough year for potatoes, but folks have been able to climb out of that with two, two, two healthy harvests. And last year, uh, I believe exceeded $200 million in sales. Um, the Potato Board and the University of Maine have a wonderful potato breeding program um, that creates new types of potatoes. The, the most recent success is the varietal known as the caribou russet. The Maine uh, Department of Agriculture has a certified uh, potato seed program where we inspect the seed before it is distributed for sale. Um, and those get sold all across the United States. And there is an increasing usage of H-2A workers um, in Arista County by uh, potato industry. Moving on from there, Tom, we also have to talk about dairy. Um, in Maine agriculture, it is not only the underpinning of the product itself for, for dairy, but the open space and the uh, fodder that they produce, that many of these um, family farms produce are so important to other types of businesses in the state, uh, processing, veterinarian, farm sales, feed, fertilizer, etc. There are, as of right now, 156 farms across 15 counties uh, that are producing milk. 53 farms are, are organic. Um, unfortunately, we've lost 25% of our farms since 2019. Um, we had a, a, a company called Horizon Organic basically pull out of Maine, which had a cascade uh, of negative effects. Um, organic feed has become really uh, exceedingly expensive. Um, and so organic dairy has had its real share of struggles as has everybody in Maine dairy. Um, this, this summer has been really poor for um, a lot of production for hay. So we're, we're hoping that this isn't too bad heading into this season, but it, it's been tough. However, that being said, we are still prolific producers of milk, 50 million gallons per year. 7% of the milk produced is organic got approximately 26,000 cows and the herds, the milking herds, um, these are the animals that are actually milked as opposed to the broader size of the, uh, the herds, um, you know, anywhere between under, under 10 to 1,500 or so. We have 150 dairy processors, according to the Maine Milk Commission. Um, there are four packaged fluid milk uh, processors in the state, think Hood, think Oakers, Smiling Hill Farm, and Pineland. Um, that is 90% of our milk being processed and packaged for drinking. 25% um, and not Pineland, excuse me, the folks up in a rustic, I misspoke, Holton. Holton. Um, when we think of uh, uh, creameries, um, we're thinking Pineland as well. We have 25 plus or minus ice cream and gelato producers. And when we think of cream, creameries, creameries on the commodity scale, um, obviously, we have some wonderful cheesemakers, butter as well. And the remaining ones are mostly artisanal throughout the state. Um, and there is um, migrant worker utilization within dairy, of course, because H-2A is a seasonal uh, program, um, H-2A workers do not work uh, within dairy. Next slide, um, apples. Um, we have 449 farms with approximately 2,700 acres. 84 of those farms produce, produce 1 million bushels of apples. Um, the average farm size is, is relatively small, 20 acres, with the largest being 320. This is according to the Maine Pomological Society. Uh, four are organic apple farms. The price per bushel uh, two years ago was $37. We have greater than 100 varieties grown in Maine. We have a really rich history of apple growing in the state. It's really fascinating. Um, and there is H-2A worker utilization um, within this category as well. I did not do a slide on Maine fruits and vegetables. Um, and also uh, we, we produce a lot of fodder and feed in the state, corn silage, for instance, hay, alfalfa hay. Um, I did not create a slide with respect to that. Um, a lot of those numbers get 
agglomerated with the rest of New England. Um, so I don't have as good statistics on it, but we, but I keep coming back to the term diversified. There's a lot of vegetable farms in the state of Maine in particular that are growing um, a host of different types of produce. Um, and uh, you know, we do have farmers markets that go year round that is reflecting um, what, what many of these farms are producing. So with that, I think I'm wrapping it up with a closing thoughts slide where we all know that there are lots of challenges facing agriculture. Mm -hmm. We have an aging workforce. Um, of course, labor constraints and costs are of concern. We have high costs of production. We're at the end of the line. It, it costs a lot. We have cold winters, relatively short summers, although the climate, the, these growing seasons are expanding somewhat. Um, many of our, our producers don't control their pricing. Um, and uh, for instance, dairy, there are federal market orders that really limit um, what producers are, are, are paid. Um, climate change is a real challenge. Uh, as we know, um, it's, it's variable is the name of the game. We have plenty of water in this state. We just happen to get it oftentimes at the wrong time. So real concern um, as, we, as we think about preparing for that going forward. There's PFAS and then of course the cost of land and development challenges, whether it's solar or, or other types of development pressures. Um, there's, there's a lot um, that makes it daunting and yet, there are opportunities that our department um, is very bullish on and, and want to do all that we can to support our farm communities. We have younger farmers. It will be interesting to see if the trend of younger farmers continues. Uh, we saw that in 2017 with some encouraging numbers surrounding that. We also have a very strong support for local food in the state. Um, that was especially made clear with the pandemic, but that has, I think, been sustained um, relatively since then. We have had infrastructure investment in the broader uh, ag and food production world over the last couple of years. There's lots of money still coming through the ARPA uh, funds and, and the department was able to, to, to do a grant recently for infrastructure. We have a goal um, within our climate action plan of consuming 30% of our locally sourced foods here in Maine by 2030. Um, we have a great food reputation um, nationally and uh, we, we, we are able to grow quality uh, food in this state because of our natural resources. So that was very fast. Um, again, not able to do justice to all of, of Maine agriculture, however, um, Let's keep these numbers in mind as we as we talk about agriculture broadly going forward over the next couple of weeks. Thank you. So we will make sure, depending on the file size, to either send these two presentations yep. to you directly, or if that doesn't work, upload them. They'll be uploaded onto the website so that you that way and we'll make sure that you're aware of what that website address is. Are there questions for Nancy or comments, clarifying information for those of you more familiar with one particular industry um, or another that, that you wanna add anything to? All right, well, obviously we'll be circling back to this information again and again. Um, so why don't we pivot then to Commissioner Fortman's presentation, although let me just ask, do we want to take a brief break, five minutes for restrooms and whatnot before we, let's do that. I think, I think that'd be the right time to do it, given the right direction of the agenda. Yeah? Do you want to name any names, Sean? <laughs> or Mike? Uh, we are we are going to try really hard to stick to whatever it is that we're saying. <laughs> Maybe a challenge, but so so um, as uh, first of all, I thought that at least for me, the last presentation was really helpful in terms of getting a little bit better grounded in what's going on in agriculture. And I was saying to Nancy that the number that jumped out at me was that 29% of the farms hire labor. And as she pointed out, it's because so many of the farms are really, really small farms and um, the people doing the work are the people who, are, who own the farms. But 
that it was just a helpful number for me to look at. As I, as I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, one of the things we also wanted to do was to get grounded in the terminology that we're using around who are these, these categories of, um, of workers. And so uh, Anne Macri is going to be doing the presentation, but um, in the audience uh, today, we also have Jorge Acero, so some of the folks may know Jorge from the work he's been doing for many, many years with farm workers. And Melissa Harvey is probably not a household name yet, but she oversees the H-2A program for us at the Maine Department of Labor. And then Mike Rowland, um, I think most folks know, he's the Bureau Director for the Bureau of Labor Standards. So they will be here um, listening to any questions people have, and then we can figure out if there's additional information that folks are going to need after Anne's presentation. Okay, Anne. Thank you. Um, so this, this might be my eye exam for the year doing this presentation. <laughs> so bear with me. Hopefully it's not that tiny, but um, I do need a new prescription. So let's find out. Okay, so um, as you know, many of you are farmers or represent farmers or represent farm workers. Um, and farms may employ a variety of uh, workers who fall into several different categories. And what we're going to do today is just go over a couple of those different categories. Um, we're going to cover um, H-2A workers, migrants, and seasonal agricultural workers. And what's listed here as main resident agricultural workers, I want to be clear, that is not a term of art. That really is just sort of shorthand to cover sort of the everybody else. So um, next slide, please. So first, let's say, why are we starting here? So um, some of this material is quite dense. Um, a lot of it may also be familiar to some of you, but because one of the committee's goals is to work from a shared understanding in this area, we thought it was important um, to start here because a lot of these terms and these categories are going to be foundational uh, to the work of this committee. So we want to establish these definitions at the outset so that we can work from that mutual understanding. Um, and as we go through future topics, um, we will be addressing whether and how these different categories of agricultural workers are or are not impacted. Um, so we are not going to delve deeply into these details of these programs or those impacts today. We're really just going to focus on the specific definitions um, because it is important that we understand what these terms are and we use them accurately and consistently. Um, before I get into the definitions, I do want to say the content on these slides largely comes from federal law and federal regulation, and that means that any potential change to Maine law is not going to change these. Next slide, please. So we're going to start with H-2A workers. This is the definition for H-2A, any temporary foreign worker who is lawfully present in the United States and authorized by DHS to perform agricultural labor or services of a temporary or seasonal nature. Um, H-2A, as we know, is, a, is an employer-sponsored immigration status. And so it has two components, that definition. As you can see, there are some bolded terms here. Each of those has its own definition, and we'll go through those. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, this is where my, my eye exam starts. Okay, so the H-2A definition of agricultural labor means all services provided, and there are two components to this definition. The first is the location where the uh, services are provided. As you see on the left, the services must be provided on a farm, and there's a list here of sort of the things that qualify as a farm. And then on the right, um, the types of services that are provided. This is not a comprehensive list, but these are the major categories. Um, otherwise, you'd be looking at a very nice long uh, regulation. So as you can see, um, cultivation of soil, raising and harvesting, also included are operations, maintenance, conservation, or improvement of the farm itself, or farm equipment and tools. Um, some level of uh, production, uh, may be included if there, if a sufficient amount of the commodity has been produced by the farm itself, but generally processing, uh, commercial canning, freezing, 
those are not going to be the type of service that is required. So um, H2A, agricultural, uh, we're looking at location and we're looking at the type of services. Both of those have to be uh, meet the, the definition. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the other component of H2A is that the uh, services have to be provided of a temporary or seasonal nature. Um, seasonal, pretty much what you think it is, a growing cycle, a specific aspect of a growing cycle, temporary, generally uh, no longer than a year. Um, in order to qualify, uh, the both criteria need to be met, both the agricultural labor, which again is where the location, uh, where the services are provided and the type of services, and also the temporary or seasonal. So Nancy mentioned earlier, dairy is not typically something that is gonna qualify for um, H2A because while dairy does constitute something that might be performed on a farm and the type of services, it is not a seasonal business. It is not, a, it generally is not gonna qualify under seasonal or temporary. Both uh, criteria need to be met. Okay, um, next slide, please. So. The next group that we're gonna talk about is migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. Uh, the definition here, again, we're looking at someone who's employed in agricultural employment of a seasonal or temporary nature. Technically, migrant and seasonal are two different statuses. Uh, the distinction between them, migrant is required to be absent overnight from their permanent place of residence, seasonal is not. For our purposes, we generally do not need to distinguish between those two. We're gonna talk about them largely as one category. Um, certain uh, folks do not qualify as migrant and seasonal. Um, immediate family member of an agricultural employer or a farm labor contractor, and also H-2A or anyone on another employer-sponsored visa cannot qualify. So again, you see we have some bolded terms here, agricultural employment, seasonal or other temporary nature. We're gonna talk about the definition of those. So the next slide, please. Okay, migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. Uh, the definition here is actually borrowed from some definitions in other federal laws with the addition, so specifically the FLSA de definition and the IRS definition with an additional clause, which you see on the left there. Um, I'm not going to go over the IRS definition because we've basically already done it. It's almost identical to the H-2A definition. The FLSA definition is on the right here, and you can see it's really focused more on services, on the types of service involved, as opposed to location. Um, in this context, only the FLSA or the IRS definition needs to be satisfied, not both. Okay, um, next slide, please. So again, we have um, seasonal or other temporary basis. This is fairly similar again to how those terms are used in the H-2A context. They're slightly different, um, largely in terms of the temporary basis. There is not this um, sort of unofficial one year cap as there is on H-2A, uh, but indefinite employment is generally not gonna be considered temporary. Um, seasonal again here is typically based on a growing season or a portion of a growing season. Okay, so just to recap with migrant and seasonal, again, you're looking at the type of services provided and that it must be a seasonal or other uh, temp or temporary basis. Both of those criteria, again, have to be met. So next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this doesn't come up a lot, but I think it's helpful sometimes just to uh, remind ourselves sort of what's the difference between these two. Um, H-2A, again, because it is an employer-sponsored status, has significant upfront process um, and requirements that apply in advance of hiring the worker, as well as obligations that apply on hiring and during that person's employment. Whereas migrant and seasonal, there is not really advanced process that is required, but there are obligations that apply when that person is hired and during their employment. Okay, so what about everybody else? Um, next slide, please. So if we have other folks who are working on a farm, who are doing agricultural work, um, who are not uh, H-2A or a migrant seasonal, then the definition that we look to is a definition under Maine law, and it is under uh, the unemployment statute. Uh, 
So this is uh, 26 MRS um, section 1043, um, specifically in minimum wage and overtime, which is subchapter three of chapter seven of title 26. Um, the, the, what we look at is section 663-3A. That section exempts an individual employed in agriculture as it is defined in the unemployment statute. So that's a, I should do a flow chart. Um, but we're looking at that unemployment definition of what is agricultural labor to determine whether the individual is employed in agriculture and therefore is exempt from subchapter three. The definition in section 1043 of agricultural labor is again, nearly identical to the H2A definition. So we're looking at services that are provided on a farm and the type of services that are involved. Um, uh, a question was raised at one point about seafood processing. Um, those folks are also exempted from subchapter three. However, they're exempted under a different section. Um, that is not anticipated to change. They are exempt under section 663, 3G, a different part of that same statute. May so, I ask a quick question? Yes. It's helpful when you gave that definition of the, the farm for the for the H two A right, so you have the farm and then you have the activity. Yes, but for the purposes of Maine residential ag workers, there's no seasonal or temporary. Overlay. There is not seasonal or temporary. The the we only look at the type of services that are being provided. Now there may be some aspects of seasonality and and the amount of work that is occurring that applies for the purposes of unemployment, mm -hmm. but we don't look at that for the purposes of whether or not they meet the definition of being employed in agriculture in section 663-3A. So we're only looking at are the types of services that are being provided those that meet the definition under that def under uh, 1043 and where that <coughs> is happening. So it is still that two part on a farm and the type of services we're not looking at the amount of time. Okay, thank you. Good question. Okay. Um, I think that was everything on that slide. Uh, so obviously this is a very quick overview of a very complicated area with a lot of intersecting laws. Um, we understand there you know, are a lot of questions that may be raised by this. Um, I wanna point you to as uh, Commissioner Fortman pointed out we have a couple of sort of subject matter experts here. Melissa's information is on the slide. Jorge is also here and has considerable expertise in this area. And then we have some resources that are available online. Um, so I will pause there and see if there are any questions. So one thought, and this is just thinking on the fly here, entirely up to the co-chairs. Would it be helpful if we backed your presentation back up to slide or whatever, not the why are we doing this, but the first definition slide to see if slide by slide there are particular <coughs> questions sure. that are relevant to that particular category. Would that be helpful? We have time to do it if that mm -hmm. seems like the right thing to spend time on. You know, again, we just want to make sure we're rock solid on these definitions because it's we're going to be referencing them at every future meeting. Okay. Um, then Tom Gordon, if you wouldn't mind. Um, uh, okay. Is that the first one? That, yes, that's, that's the first sort of content slide. Yep. Okay. And maybe we can, you know, take them in, in a cluster because there were several that dealt with H2A. But if we want to just give you a moment mm -hmm. then to review that and then maybe move to the next whatever number of slides also deal with H2A and then pause there and see what questions come up around this particular classification of workers. Yeah, I, I know our data is miserable uh, overall, but do we have uh, any, what's our general sense of thinking about the main um, agricultural workforce, the, the numeric breakdown across these three categories? Do we have any? Sense of that. I will tell you what I know and then invite 
the folks from the Department of Labor to, to add to that. Um, the 2017 Ag Census does include data about migrant workers and their definition is of that temporary uh, nature, you know, away from their primary residence. Um, and they do have some statistics of the number of farms using migrant labor across type of operations like vegetable and melon farms, fruit and nut farms. Um, there are also the number of migrant workers by county and um, farm labor by value of ag production sold. So basically it gets into the size of farms again. I know where those are in the ag census and I can provide them, um, but I don't have them on me right now. And just to be clear, if that if that data is around the migrant seasonal farm workers, those are not those H two A workers. That's right. So, so again, right. just like sticking to the those different categories. And I can't tell Melissa if you had data that you wanted to share or not. I have this year's numbers. Um, I did not bring any prior. Well, I I do have some prior years, but. Um, this year, this year for our H-2A participating employers, we're currently at 114. It's 114, sorry. Um, requested workers are 1,297. Um, of those participating employers, uh, 11 of them have been in logging and 15 of them have been in apples. Um, and that's the only breakdown that I have um, on those. Did you say that total worker number again? 11. 1297. That's requested workers. So, yeah. And again, for clarity around that, Matt, the fact that someone requested 1200 workers does not mean that 1200 workers were there. Correct. Should we move on to the next slide that gives a little bit more breakdown of this or other questions on this one? You don't have to go back, but I mean, what, how do you define temporary or seasonal? Um, so if you want to go not to the next slide, but the following slide, that is the, the this is the temporary or seasonal. Um, for H-2A purposes, you're usually looking at a growing season. Sometimes it's a specific portion of the growing season. Um, and for temporary, you're really looking, I mean, temporary is temporary. Um, and generally, it's capped at uh, a year. A year in length? or I'm, I'm having a hard time because you got the number, the logging in there, too. So I'm under, trying to understand how you define uh, temporary she's on that I believe the way that it works and, and uh, Melissa or Jorge could uh, correct me if I'm wrong is that when the employer um, makes a request they have to identify the period of time for which that person will be employed because the visa only lasts that long with maybe some grace period around their entry and exit um, so if an employer were to ask for a period that was longer than a year that visa would likely not be granted because it would not constitute a temporary uh, period of time. Um, so there isn't necessarily a, a, a specific... Um, you could ask for 11 months. You could. You would have to justify what your, you know, what it was based on. But yes, you're looking at the, the nature of the business, the nature of the growing season, um, what the specific need is, um, and if that is sufficiently within the, the definition, then likely it would be granted. Can you go ahead, Mike? Um, Melissa, do we have any idea how many of those 1,200 roughly requested workers are for logging as opposed to other farm labor? I did not bring that breakdown, but I can certainly provide that for you. From 100. You should be able to help look. Okay, so. Um, duly noted in terms of a request for information, we'll, we'll see about getting that to you. Um, and if this is not helpful, you'll be the first to tell me, I'm sure both of you please, but with the pieces of information that exist to your question, to the information that you have, and to Nancy, the information that you have, is there any way to piece together the rough percentage of all agricultural workers that break into these three categories? Like, is that, 
think it's going to be pretty rough, but there, I think we can fill some holes. Would you know, that would that the, be helpful? with the caveat that it's now at least five years old? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would find that very helpful. Okay, all right. Let's try to do that then. Um, do we want to move back to the pr previous? No, I don't think so. Good on that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Moving forward, any... Oh, go ahead. Just real quick. One thing I don't want to lose sight of is that not all farm workers in Maine are either seasonal mm -hmm. or migrant. Mm -hmm. we, right. have, we have a number of, as Mr. Miller knows, we have a number of people who work year-round, mm -hmm. and those are people that we would be, you know, mm -hmm. that would be involved in this discussion. Mm -hmm. Right. I think those are the folks who would be captured under the sort of everybody else definition at the end, which is the agricultural labor definition. The, I, I got to ask this. Um, so not Mr. Miller, but anyone in the dairy industry, I mean, could they ask for a worker for 11 months and get it in each a category? It's, it's my understanding that, that we, we could, and I've heard of folks not in the state of Maine, but outside of the state of Maine that have utilized the H-2A program for harvesting crops or something. But as far as milking a cow or feeding a calf, which is our most labor intensive mm -hmm. uh, things, because we do it year round, we can. not <laughs> Other questions about this definition? Okay, let's move on to the next one then. Give you a moment with this. Jody, what's the best, just on like process, I mean, what's the best way to think about like things we want to better understand? Like is it sending feedback to the co-chairs? Like for example, like I, I'd be interested to understand the mechanics of H2A just deeper. Like, like where does enforcement reside? What does the application process entail? Uh, like uh, the, you know, who are the brokers? And, and so just, I, I want to like very much yeah. keep this in the, yeah. you know, and so just trying to like think process wise to make this as efficient and effective. Okay, and, and so Matt, I think this is one of those places where I'd say, we're trying to keep the guardrails right. on minimum right. wage. Right. And I think that um, digging into H2A is probably not going to help us get to that. And there are a ton of presentations. And I think that's why we're providing Melissa's information, because I think that it there's information about it. It's an extensive process. There are multiple um, places to go. but. Let's, let's see if we can do it that way. Okay, uh, question, Arthur. You know, uh, already which presentations are, are certainly scheduled to take place and, and which are kind of still to be determined in, in future meetings? So, so the way that we were looking at teeing this up, Arthur, is looking at the issues that kind of surfaced for areas of confusion or question during the legislative session. So things like unemployment insurance. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted to get grounded in, okay, here are the different categories of workers. Let's look at some of the labor standards and say, let's look at unemployment insurance. Who is currently covered or not covered now? How does being an H-2A worker or a migrant seasonal farm worker or a resident, um, whatever name Ann made up to cover the everybody else category, how are they impacted by that policy? Um, and, uh, and then what impact, if any, does minimum wage, a change to the minimum wage law have on unemployment insurance, um, you know, uh, the, uh, I'm trying to remember the like, workers comp, um, all of those issues that were raised and looking at it that way. So to keep it kind of contained to what currently exists, what are all of these labor laws, how do these different kind of categories of workers, um, are, how are they impacted by these various categories? Uh, that, that's that's the plan. So I think we've got the list that's in the executive order, Arthur, and so that's what we were planning to do. 
So that's probably the best place to look at that. So things like, um, you know, piece rate was one of the issues that came up. Um, Independent contractor status, record keeping. Yeah. Overtime maximum limitations, wage calculation, particularly around housing, providing of housing, um, and other relevant employment related criteria. So that is a little bit of a long list. I think obviously that there's there's other relevant you know topics that we want to surface and determine whether or not to add them to that list. And I would just say to you know pull the curtain back, uh, you know because everything's transparent here is we thought about coming up with a schedule from day one and having a topic for each one of the meetings. But we were super clear about the first two meetings. And then we thought, let's see what the right progression is after that. So we know as much as the commissioner and deputy commissioner said, but we weren't clear on what the right order of that would be, where, what would be most helpful. And we have a planning session after each one of these meetings to figure that out each time. So ideas that you have or suggestions that you have are certainly welcome in that regard in terms of order. Okay, um, other questions on this? So what if we move on, just because I can't remember what the next slide was. Um, yeah, go ahead. Are we taking questions on this slide right now? Oh, okay. back, back up, <clears throat> you wanna back up that one or the next one? Well, as long, whenever we're done talking about this federal law, I'll have a question. Okay. Um, well, then let's move. We were just there, right? So let's move on to the next slide and see if there's any further um, questions that come up on this category of migrant and seasonal agricultural workers. Is there another slide after this one on the yes. same category? Yep. All right. Let's move to that for a moment. Yeah, maybe that's. And that's the last slide on this particular category? Yes. Okay. Anything further on this one? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much, AAG Macri, for doing this. Um, and, and I want to focus on this federal statute mm -hmm. for a second, because it appears as it give, gives extra rights to individuals. And it, and it does, but only under federal law, yes. correct? And workers who qualify for protections under that law qualify for the federal minimum wage, but they are still not considered employees in the state of Maine under the section that you talked about in section 663. They're not considered employees for the state minimum wage and so, overtime. I wanna be careful about the terminology that we use here. The, the, the question as to whether someone is entitled to uh, the state minimum wage is not necessarily really a question of whether they're an employee or not. It is whether they are an individual who is employed in agriculture. If they are an individual who is employed in agriculture under the current law, they are exempt from all of subchapter three. That does not necessarily mean that that person is not an employee. But for the purposes of minimum wage and overtime, they are exempt. They are exempt from subchapter, yes. And that's true for all of the workers in this category that are protected by the that federal would be law true as well. in general yes these folks would fall under um they're they're likely going to meet the if they meet the definition of an agricultural employee of migrant or seasonal agriculture employee then they are very likely going to be someone who is employed in agriculture under the same uh under the definition in, in section 1043 and in, in the unemployment law um so when when a, a question comes in about a worker um the, the status of whether that worker is an H-2A worker or a migrant seasonal worker isn't really the question that gets asked for the purposes of whether subchapter three applies. It is whether they are an individual who is employed in agriculture. But the vast majority of the time, I think there could maybe be some rare exceptions, but mostly someone who meets that definition is also going to be considered an employee who is uh, an individual who is employed in agriculture and therefore will be exempt from subchapter three, which means exempt from minimum wage, state minimum wage, and overtime. And, and therefore entitled to the federal minimum wage. They would qualify for the federal minimum wage. But state, state DOL has no jurisdiction to investigate the wages that they're being paid. Um, not under the minimum wage 
subchapter, not under subchapter three. <laughs> there might they might qualify under other um, labor laws, which is a topic we're going to go into more detail on in our next meeting. So, in terms of what what wage applied to them, whether it's minimum wage or a different wage, that they would not be covered. Thank you. So, did did everyone understand that? that exchange there <laughs> about the employment piece? Yes, or should Ann restate it? Because I, it, for me, anyhow, I think that's kind of the crux of some of the confusion. So Ann, you had said, be very careful about how we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. It's not that, oh, you're an employee or you're not an employee. It's the employment, uh, it's the ki kind of work where you're doing the work and what protections, but you said it much better and clearer. So please say yes. that again. Uh, so actually, if we want to go to, I think it's the next slide. Um, what we're looking at again is this definition of, oh, one more. There we go. Um, whether someone is an individual employed in agriculture, right? That's the terminology that is in the statute. Um, it is, it is in the definition section of subchapter three. If someone meets that definition of being an individual employed in agriculture, for which we look to, are they performing the type of services that are included in that definition um, in section 1043, which is type of services and on a farm, um, then that person is going to be exempt from all of subchapter three. And subchapter three is what governs minimum wage and overtime. There are a couple of other things in subchapter three, um, but that is the minimum wage and overtime statute. So it does not, it's, it's really not looking at the nature of that employment relationship. So for instance, when we talk about the difference between an employee and an independent contractor, that's a different test, right? That's a completely different thing. Um, what we're talking about here is if the person the person can be an employee and have an employment relationship, what we would consider sort of a one way to describe it as a W-2 employment relationship with the farm that they work for, for instance, um, and still be an individual employed in agriculture and therefore be exempt from subchapter three. Yeah. So just to be clear, individuals employed in agriculture in the state of Maine are exempt from the state minimum wage and overtime under yes. chapter three. Yes. Thank you. And he shall be quoted. That is precisely accurate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I was going to ask, but it says above that that it's nearly identical to the H2A difference with minor differences. So what, what are the minor differences? So um, I would have to put them side by side. Yeah. The one that I am aware of is that the 1043 definition includes the term aquaculture, um, which helpfully is not defined, um, which H2A does not use. Um, so um, that's that's the primary difference that I'm aware of. It When I say the agricultural labor definition, I'm talking about the agricultural labor definition that the H2A uses for agricultural labor, not whether someone qualifies to be an H2A worker, right? Because as Nancy pointed out earlier, seasonal and temporary don't apply in this circumstance. We're really just talking about the type of services that are provided. Right, but if you're an H2A worker, you're considered agricultural at all times. Yes, someone who is an H2A worker um, is going to meet the definition of, a, of, a, of performing agricultural labor. Other questions or clarifying or clarification? Yeah, go ahead, Chad. Um, sorry, the bill mentioned in the executive order, I think it was LD 398, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Which definition was that addressing? So that bill was addressing the definition that is in section 663 3A. So an, an employee. Uh, it is it is an exemption that right, is sorry, under the definition sorry. of employee. Yes. So that uh, the the what that bill was doing in part was taking out that exemption. Okay, but there's also we have this main resident agricultural workers, which, from what I understand, is sort of an umbrella term. And 
you might say an employee or an exempt employee is under that term as well as like an H2A worker who is a sort of different overlapping status? No. So someone who is um, either an H2A worker or a, um, a, a migrant seasonal worker, they have their own definitions for, for that status. Um, if the question is whether or not someone is eligible for the minimum wage, we don't necessarily look to that particular status. Um, we look at this definition of whether or not they are ex an individual employed in agriculture. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Did I hear, did I see something? Yeah. yeah? Okay, all right, yes, Tom. And correct me if I'm wrong, but so again, fair to say if LD398 had not been vetoed, individuals employed in agriculture would be subject to the state minimum wage. They would no longer be exempt from that coverage. That's right, right. Okay. that's right. Thank you. The exemption is what was removed. We're taking the away the exemption. Yes. Except for overtime. Just right, I'm just talking about minimum yes. wage. Mm -hmm. Okay. Move on to the third. Yeah. Hearing no objections. <laughs> Stunned into silence here. Let's move on to the next slide. I think that's really. Oh, the that is the slide. slide. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so so that was it. Okay. All right. Any Thing further in terms of questions about these definitions, you will get this presentation as well. Yes, Arthur. Sorry, just to clarify, the first definition has a, a federally mandated minimum wage, which is currently, I think, sixteen ninety-five. The H two A worker, but the mm -hmm. second, but the second and third categories, as we're kind of categorizing them here, do not have a higher minimum wage than the federal. Right. So the mm -hmm. the the wage rate that is paid to H-2A workers, I'm not sure it's exactly right to call it a minimum wage. Um, it's it's a adverse, it's the a adverse effect in, uh, wage rate. It's, um, uh, so there is a federally determined wage rate that is paid to H-2A workers. Um, and then for migrant seasonal, there's not a specific, that statute does not identify a specific wage rate. And then everyone else is whether or not they're covered by or exempt from subchapter three or not. Thanks. Jorge, are you going to correct? Yeah, I just feel free to, to correct me. Okay. <laughs> holding back as much as I can, but I just wanted to say um, under the FLSA, there is an agricultural uh, guarantee of the federal minimum wage. Okay. So all migrant and independent, what I call independent migrant and seasonal farm workers that I'm knocking at your door, one must pay the federal minimum wage or above. But that, but the Migrant Seasonal Protection Act doesn't set its own wage rate, correct? Not that, but it goes by the FLSA okay, yeah. and that's enforced by USDO wage an hour. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the reasons this is so confusing, I think, is that you know, so many, st what drives so many specific statutes are the definitions. They, like, that's how they're, that's how they're written. And every statute that we're dealing with has its, a different, a slightly different definition. And it's very confusing to sort of try to think of it as just one thing. Like, you know, farm workers are, you know, if you're an employee, um, you, you, you get this benefit under this law as employee is defined um, over here. And there's another statute with another definition of employee, and I think that the, the it, it, you know one one way to think about this that might be helpful is that for each law that we're talking about, the question is whether farm workers are covered by it or not, and how farm workers are defined. And like Tom has been taking great pains to point out, farm workers are not covered by Section 663, and we that's why we don't have the minimum wage for farm workers in Maine, and. They are covered, as we'll hear later on, by other statutes, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not employees or are employees. They're employees for specific purposes. And it's, you know, that, and I'm not sure I'm shedding a whole lot of light on this, but it's, I, it, I think it's a, 
it's important to, it, it helps to think about this in terms of what laws apply and what laws don't. Well, honestly, I have a hard time to figure that out myself. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, H2A is agriculture and every log and position is an ag culture. And we have prevailing wage rates that not only are much higher than the minimum wage, they actually force you to pay time and a half, and but they're H2A workers. So I don't really understand. I mean, I'm sure it's just for somebody's benefit that they've been poked in these holes. And uh, Well, I think part of the thinking behind the way in which subsequent presentations are going to be structured is precisely to your point is how does this, how do these definitions intersect with each of these various laws? Um, so I, I think you've summarized the conundrum well, and we're trying our best to address that right. sort of by breaking it down. And, and Senator Jackson makes a very good point. I mean, H2A is kind of an outlier. You know, it's it's you know it's a, it's a very specific program that's designed to to meet a very specific goal for employers who are able to convince the Department of Labor that they can't find U.S. workers to do the job. You know, whether or not that's true is something that we've been fighting about in Maine for as long as I can remember. Mm -hmm. But the you know it it is not a tip you know it's it's not the norm in agriculture. You know, it's it's very specific. It's only for certain purposes and it's only used in, in certain places. And it's got its own rules, it's got its own wage rate, it's, it's sort of off by itself. Any other questions about what's been presented? Right, then I, I guess, please. you know, getting back to that, so if a farm worker comes in under H2A, I mean, is the, uh, the commissioner of labor, the secretary of labor, are they understanding that farm workers aren't getting overtime? So you're saying the U.S. Department yeah. of Labor, do they understand what is covered and not covered for H-2A workers? And, well, yeah, and just like, again, you know, help me. I don't, and I don't want to, you know, hold this up, but yeah. if H-2A is, is always agriculture, I'm having a hard time to understand how they allow some H-2A workers to not get overtime and not get minimum wage and other ones to get uh, minimum wage and overtime. So the, um, the requirements for H-2A are to pay, as you know, the higher wage rate. And it also includes other requirements as well. Off the top of my head, I don't know. I'm looking at Jorge and Melissa about overtime, we're, but it's a, we're talking about separate statutes here. So, and, I, and we're again um, those rails that you've wanted to keep in place. We're if we're if we're jumping into the logging cart right now. No, no that's not my intention. My intention is I, well, understand the why question. H2A uh, workers in the farming yeah. don't get the same. What it is is that uh, an employer is allowed to offer whatever incentive they want in order to hire people. But the minimum requirement under the H2A program is to pay the adverse effect wage rate for that occupation. Logging in its own silo has a hybrid um, wage survey. In fact, we just submitted it to the federal government, uh, to the federal USDOL for approvement. And it uh, has been doing, in, in fact, uh, 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 by occupation. In other words, for each type of machine, um, what, uh, what the survey finds US workers are earning uh, and the survey respondents respond and then a wage is determined there at a at a certain uh, percentage of respondents, and that those results are sent to USUL, and the w Woods Wage Survey is set, and those are the required wages. So you'll have uh, certain machine operators earning $17, $18 an hour, others uh, positions operating engineers making $20 an hour, $22 an hour, et cetera. And for incentives, they are allowed to offer uh, to start people, the more experience you have, they can start higher, and they can also 
are allowed to pay uh, overtime if they want to. It is not a requirement and it's not required to pay overtime. In agriculture itself, you rarely see the, the incentive of overtime, but instead bonuses at the end or the incentive to work piece rate because you can make much more money in piece rate even at the going adverse effect wage rate. Yeah. So I, I, again, we're, it, it, sounds like, it sounds like we need a small group discussion for those who want to talk about H2A and what the ins and outs are. Um, but for the purposes of this group, I, I think we need to try to... No, I understand that. But I mean, I think going through there, we heard all the different agricultural that uses H2 workers. And, and I just don't understand why, I mean, the problem wouldn't already fix itself if H2 workers and on the H2 workers, if they're considered uh, that they should get unemployment, uh, excuse me, uh, overtime and minimum wage. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I just confused me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and it sounds, Senator, and I would need to dig into this, Mr. President, a little bit more, but it sounds like they're not guaranteed overtime, but that in some instances, employers are offering overtime to some H2A workers. But let's dig into that and add that to our list for clarification. Um, we do know that the adverse wage um, is significantly higher and that does change on a yearly basis. And right now it is about 1680. 1695. 95, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, but just testing of seeing what we have for public interest in making public comment, um, unless there are other burning questions or clarifications that are needed on the presentations. Again, we'll figure out a way to get those to you as soon as possible. Um, so I think for those online, um, if you wanted to raise your hand on your screen, uh, do the raise hand button so we can see if there's anybody who is listening in and wants to make a comment. And seeing none, um, if there's anybody here in the room, uh, likewise, who would like to do so. Yes, Senator Tipping. Move up here. That's okay. So I'm a very interested member of the public. <laughs> and it's, uh, <laughs> wonderful to be here and I'm happy to service Senate President Jackson's alternate as well. Um, I just wanted to know, I mean, we talked about at the beginning of this being a reset, but I just wanted to acknowledge all the work that has gone into, um, you know, the legislation that we discussed earlier this year and, you know, the conversations that have been had already. Um, most led by the governor's own administration. You know, most of the bill that was considered was written by the governor's own administration and the explanation of what it meant, you know, the memos and the conversations were also done by her administration. So I was, you know, very disappointed uh, in that veto. Um, and I hope that um, in the continuation of this conversation and the Beginning, we talked about uh, public comment being useful for clarifying or for setting expectations or suggestions around future things. I think it'd be great if we could take that list of um, areas where there seemed to be some confusion. Um, seemed like piecework, um, overtime, record keeping, unemployment, et cetera. I'd love to know, you know, what those exactly were, you know, a lot of the stuff, including things we've, we've talked about today, did come up in those previous conversations. We had a whole uh, full day of hearings and, you know, multiple meetings, including an extra one, you know, when we had the final version of the legislation. So I appreciate everyone in this room and I actually like everyone here. Um, I'm also one of those strange people that really likes presentations like these and I could sit there and, you know, Love a PowerPoint about Maine's agriculture. Um, we can get some snacks and we can have some fun all together here. But I don't think the the points where there may have been confusion, according to the, the governor, 
were around, you know, what percentage of farms have employees or, you know, H2A workers, although I do appreciate the Senate president bringing in some conversational logging, which was the new thing today that we discussed a bit. Um, so I would love if there are specific areas that the governor has concerns about, that there is needed clarification, what those are and how we're going to address them. If there is a different proposal for how to get to a minimum wage for farm workers, which she says is her objective, I'd like to, to hear what that is. Um, you know, because there's been a lot of work done on this. There's a lot of other work that needs to be done to safeguard farm workers. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to support agriculture. There's a lot of smart people in this room that I would love being able to, you know, focus on all those things. So the concerns that were listed earlier, they seem like something that could be addressed with a white paper or, you know, maybe even an, an email. Um, but if they need to be, you know, presentations, let's at least be having those that are addressing those potential concerns. So those are my thoughts and I appreciate the time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Others? Yes, please. My name is Jenny Hilton Flood. I'm a citizen and a dairy farmer here in Maine. I just thank you all for doing this work. I appreciate it. Um, my one big question, it's more of a question or a, a plea, is that the people that we're talking about aren't represented in any of the data. I would really wish that at this point, work was done to make sure that farm workers are represented in data. Yes, H-2A workers are well represented in data. We have reporting of that. But when it comes to those who work in ag production on a daily basis, we do not have those records. Usually the only time they're going to get into DLL records, correct me if I'm wrong, is if there's an awful accident, correct? If we would have that information, if we would have a purpose and an intentionality to make sure that they are accounted for, then we would have a much easier time, and maybe this is why it's not done, a much easier time ensuring that they are protected, they are secured, and that they are provided for so that they can continue to lift up our communities and our economy and our food system. So I would like to think that even though that's not in your list of charges, that as part of your purpose, you would be finding a way to make sure that we do have that information and it does get accrued and accounted for because right now there is no one actually truly representing a farm worker in this room. Um, we have representatives of organizations and they do a fantastic job, but until we're able to make sure that they're represented at least in numbers, we're not going to have their voice and we're truly not going to be able to account for them. Thank you. Others, I just want to take the public first. Um, anybody else here? And Tom, Gordon, are you seeing anyone else that raised their hand? Okay. Um, oh, we do have one. Yeah. Uh, Heather Priest. Can we uh, bring her video in as well? That's up to her to do that. Oh, sure. Yeah. Or at least her audio. Hopefully, you're hearing us, Heather. I'm trying to. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Well, this isn't Heather Priest. Somehow her name's, or this is Senator Jeff Timberlake. <laughs> Somehow her name's under my thing. Must be there from a long time ago, and I ain't smart enough to change it. <laughs> How's that right. for an honest answer? And I can't even make the video work. <laughs> It says I cannot start video because the host has disabled it. So oh. you, you you don't want to see me anyway. I'm dressed like a farmer today. Anyway, uh, excuse me. We can hear you well. Go right ahead. Excuse, I've, I've listened to you all day, and it's been very interesting. And I I thank you for all being here. I think the concerns that I that I bring here today after after listening to the first part of it, and I'm real interested to follow up, to listen to the follow up, the follow up meetings is, you know, one of the concerns that really came to my mind was we're dealing with information that's five years old before the pandemic. I think it's very concerning to me as a businessman and a farmer, uh, how times have changed and how the ways of doing business have changed uh, in that period of time. So I hope before we get done, we're gonna get information that is more up to date uh, and more current because I think it's uh, 
very interesting when I look back at our own experiences on our own family farm of what the differences are before and after. I think another concern that really brings me forward here is these meetings are being held during almost every farmer in the state of Maine's busy time of year. And they're gonna have a very hard time following it. You know, us in the apple industry, you know, we're going to the end of October. Potato industry will go somewhere close to the same. The dairy industry, as everybody knows, has had the most horrific year in the world of haying. And uh, everybody that I talk to is out trying to hay and participating. So I'm very, very concerned of how we get this information out to all the farming industries in the state of Maine and make sure that they know what's happening. Uh, I hope it's something that the Department of Ag has a plan to do to make sure I'm very happy that you're recording this. Um, I look forward to trying to figure out how to share it. Hell, I can't even change uh, Heather Priest's name, but somebody else was smart enough to do it here just a minute ago. So that, that's done me a favor. Um, but uh, I, those are the things that concern me. Um, I look forward to, to hearing more of the presentation. Um, I've been involved in it. There was a whole bunch of times I wanted to say that's right or that's wrong, but that's what you sit back here and listen. So I think those are my comments. Um, I hope you take them to, for what they were um, and, and, and what you paid me for them. So those are all be something that goes along and I look forward to participating with you along the way. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much. Um, anyone else, either online or in person, for public comment? Okay. Um, did you have? Just, just an, I'm cognizant about <clears throat> your request not to talk too much. Uh, but I want to thank uh, Ginny Tilton Flood for her comments. And I think they identify one of the problems we have when it comes to data. You have a lot of data about H2A workers. We know how much they're paid. We know how many are requested. We know how many are approved. For all those other workers that are involved in production of agricultural products in Maine, the Maine Department of Labor has absolutely no jurisdiction to go in to get that data because they're not enforcing a state minimum wage because the state minimum wage doesn't apply to persons, individuals employed in agriculture. So the only data we would have is if there, the United States Department of Labor is looking in to see whether or not the federal minimum wage is being complied with. But I think everyone here knows that most workers, most farm workers in Maine are making more than the federal minimum wage. And I've heard from farmers that they're all making more than the state minimum wage. But we don't know that because we don't have the data that was just being spoken about. Um, and that, that's out there. And, and I know, you know, and I, I don't mean to put Mike Roll on the spot in his last three weeks of employment with, with the state, but we've talked about this, right? If you get a complaint about wages being paid from a person, an in, individual employed in agriculture, does the Department of Labor go out there to investigate that? Depends. Yes, if we have jurisdiction, absolutely. We enforce the statutes <clears throat> that apply. It happens that the minimum wage doesn't apply to agricultural workers, so we wouldn't have the ability to enforce it. But as far as the data, if I could just continue for another minute or two, the data, the Department of Labor, state or federal, doesn't really collect um, data on a large scale based on our investigations. We investigate complaints, and sometimes we do proactive investigating, but to generate data of the kind you're talking about, I think, would require larger surveys, possibly our unemployment insurance data. That's most. That's the most universal data that we have on workers in Maine, I believe, and and other sources of data that that just aren't as available as as I wish they were. Um, and I think Nancy, Nancy's demonstrated Nancy demonstrated the limitations of of the available data. But to rely on the wage and hour enforcement. To produce data is is the wrong way to go about it. And so to just kind of follow up on that, um, Mike, one of the charges is to gather data to the extent practicable um, on wages, benefits, and and other information. So that is a charge here. 
I, I think you've identified what some of the challenges are. I don't know that we're going to, in the couple of weeks that we have, be able to create some perfect data system, but I think it is important to begin identifying what are the sources of data that exist, what is it that we can pull together, um, and it, I don't think that um, it's something that either of our departments can do on our own. Um, and so I, I think, you know, again, I'm going back to when Nancy did her presentation and said that 29% of the farms hired um, farm labor. I, I think one of the one of the pleas I would make, and that might be to you as well, Senator Timberlake, is that data that you have, if you could provide that to us, that would be that would be really helpful. And it might not be complete, um, but we are trying to pull together the best information that we have. And there is no system right now that is designed to gather all of it. So anything that we can put together and use to um, inform this and other conversations that I'm sure will happen would be helpful. And by us, I think I'm saying send it to the website, which if I knew what that was, I would be happy to provide that. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the website itself is uh, main.gov slash labor slash MWAW. Mm -hmm. We'll send it around in, in yeah, emails we'll as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and try to come up with an easier thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, please, Eric. Uh, I would agree with what a lot of folks have said about a lack of information. I think that came up very early on in these conversations. Um, it's very important for us all to understand, especially uh, farmers involved and people who represent farmers, what are going to be the impacts of any changes on the producers that would have to bear them, as well as on the farm workers. Um, but I don't think that we need necessarily to get information through um, statutory changes. I think there's other places that we can satisfy that need. For example, the University of Maine does all kinds of surveys, would be a great resource, um, probably not on this timeline, but in helping to get us information, um, you know, to help understand uh, ag labor in this state. Um, and then as Senator Timberlake mentioned, also uh, the next uh, ag census, I think would also help us. And the timing of that, just to remind folks, spring 2024 at the earliest, I think. Maybe they'll beat their own prognostications. <laughs> Thank you. I'm thinking that we are wrapping up unless there's something major that you thought we were going to cover that we didn't. Um, it could be helpful to the extent that we're clear on what the general content of the next presentation will be to, to share that now and because uh, I think it's being queued up. Um, sure. Um, so we anticipate at the next meeting that we are going to cover um, a variety of the uh, labor standards laws that do currently apply um, and go over some of the basics of um, what those laws are, um, how they're enforced, who they apply to, and how. Okay. All right. And so, I think and we had two requests for data. I'm trying to remember mm -hmm. um, what they were. Um, I understood that you were curious about the H2A workers that fell within the forestry realm. Do I recall that right. correctly? And then more broadly was if we were able to piece something together that broke down those three categories, how mm -hmm. they overlay with um, Maine's agricultural workers. Um, that's what I got. <laughs> and I think the other thing that I think I heard from uh, the Senate president was around the applicability or not of overtime protections for H2A workers and how how that fits. So I'm, I'm thinking it might just be useful to have a pure H2A. Actually, 
yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. So with that, we're at concluding remarks, and then we'll talk about next steps, next meeting, and get feedback from you about this meeting. <coughs> well, uh, I think this was really helpful. I feel like we're sort of cautiously, you know, debuting and and um, and surfacing the outlines of this meeting. And I think it, we put a lot of time and effort into trying to figure out what were sort of the key baseline things to debut with. Hopefully it met your expectations that we'll um, build upon for the next meeting. And uh, your, your, your feedback and thoughts beyond that um, are gonna be really important and helpful to make sure that we use our time wisely going forward. But anyway, I, I found this to be a really helpful conversation to start. So thank you for that. Thank you, Nancy, and I, I want to echo what you said about, um, you know, we're trying to tee this up. This is a, uh, you know, every time it's like, what is that, that analogy? It's like the balloon or something, you push it here and it bumps out someplace else. Um, in, in many ways, this conversation, that's how it feels. There are so many ways we can dive into this, and our goal is to come up with a uh, a, as we keep getting back to a shared understanding of how minimum wage will um, uh, impact um, agricultural workers and uh, farmers here in Maine. Um, and that's our, that's our goal. Um, and we're trying to take it off in little, little bites and hopefully uh, get to that shared understanding. But I appreciate your your time, your willingness to show up here on one of the most beautiful days we've had all summer, um, and um, and your willingness to continue to stay engaged. So, so thank you, and please give us um, questions in between. We will be, uh, as Nancy said, sitting down, debriefing, trying to tee up information in a way that that is helpful to you and to us moving the process along. So um, generally, the, our debrief meetings, just as a planning team, happen just a couple of days after the existing meeting. So I think we're meeting in two days by Zoom. So if you have immediate thoughts that you don't feel like sharing amongst the whole group, um, what I would suggest is that maybe um, because you all in the um, email packet that you got this uh, today for today's meeting had Dylan's email address in it. Maybe the best thing would be to funnel comments to him because um, he'll he'll be in that planning meeting. Um, your next meeting is three weeks from now, as opposed to two. It's uh, almost all the meetings are on a Monday, I believe, from here on. Um, so the next meeting is September 25th in this room, a half an hour less time, and we finished early. Uh, today. And so who knows, maybe it'll be even less time than that. We'll see. But um, the meeting after that is virtual, but it's just one week after that. So um, you will receive an agenda for the meeting on the 25th and any meeting materials it, roughly one week prior to the meeting of the 25th. Um, who knows, right, uh, before the meeting after that, as quickly as we possibly can. But We'll, we'll try to give you a, a few days uh, of prep for that meeting as well. Um, yeah, and if you, you know, again, to your point, I think, have thoughts on the order of issues that you think would be most helpful, that would be very helpful to us. Um, and I think that's it. Um, any feedback at all about the day would be great to inform how we structure next uh, the next meeting. Um, so welcome to have to hear that now or by email as well. Yeah. Super quick thought. Just uh, I mean, to your point, Commissioner Fortman, it, it might be helpful from a facilitator perspective just to have like a parking lot because I find my own brain like like there, our charge is fairly narrow, and specific, and direct, and it's very easy to be like, oh, I'm interested in this thing, and I don't, you know, like, and so just just like to keep us on like that's really important, that's interesting, that matters, but that's not our task at hand. So, you know, everything that I'm ignorant about, about H2A stuff that's not minimum wage can go up here or, you know, 
who are the brokers and how do they operate and how are they regulated you can go up here and just you know like that um and what happens with that and what you know the department can do and what future data we might you know like it just seems like there might be a useful construct that we could all use to shape our yeah. engagement in a very like in the yeah. box outside the box um, that's what that paper behind you was meant for that i didn't use <laughs> so we'll just make sure that we use it at the next meeting all right well i think with that thank you so much and we'll see you in three weeks Thank you.